I'm very sorry not to be with you all in person, but I wanted to share a few thoughts about John because he and my father had a very special friendship for more than 50 years. And they were more than friends. They were brought together by a shared passion for using radio to reach those who would never otherwise hear about Jesus and the hope he offers. Together with others, they founded a built-up FIBA radio and were co-workers in that ministry for most of their lives. When I told my brother the sad news about John's death, he sent me a WhatsApp saying, at least he and Dad can now have a chat about FIBA. He was only joking, but in a way that sums up their relationship. So many of my memories of John growing up are of him having conversations with my father, whether it was long telephone calls or meetings that seemed to go on for hours on end, there was always much to discuss, not to mention the endless letters. Their friendship began because John was a radio engineer working in the programme department of the Far East Broadcasting Company, FEBC, a US-founded organisation which was broadcasting Christian programmes from Manila in the Philippines into China and Southeast Asia. They needed interesting programme material and my father recorded some links and interviews from the Farnborough Air Show, which was supplied to John because it was a popular event with Asian audiences. And then John came over to the UK on furlough in 1959 because he wanted to awaken the British Christian public to the potential of Christian radio and felt it would be good if a small organisation was set up to share the vision with churches in the UK and to support the work of FEBC. They became known as the FEBC Associates and as they spread the word about FEBC, money to support the work started to come in. Eventually, they were able to support their first missionaries, Malcolm and Maureen Fidge, to work in one of FEBC's production studios in Bangalore. But FEBC had a problem at this time. They were broadcasting Christian programmes into India from Manila, but most of the listeners were in the Christianised South, and few heard the signal in North India, where there was a vast Hindu population who'd never heard about Jesus. So in 1966, they started looking for a new transmitter base, and it was John Wheatley who noted that the British government wanted to establish an airport on the Seychelles Islands. It would be an ideal transmitter base from which to cover the whole of India, Pakistan, as well as North East and East Africa and the Middle East. So FEBC asked the associates in the UK if they would take on the project, building, staffing and running the station. My father told Bob Bowman, the president of FEBC, that if they could have John Wheatley as station director, they would take the project on, even though they only had £400 in the bank at the time. And that's what happened. John, Alice and their family went out to the Seychelles, and John supervised the building of the studio, transmitter building and staff housing. And within three years, FIBA was broadcasting into the vast subcontinent of India, with its population of 350 million in nine different languages, and the rest is history. By the time the station closed in 2003, it was broadcasting in 60 languages into India, Africa and the Middle East. And today, of course, FIBA's work continues, supporting its partners across the Arab world, Africa and Asia using radio and other media platforms. There isn't time to talk about how FIBA grew and developed under God's provision and of John's vital role in that, but it's important to say that many people tuned into the broadcasts and still do. I can still remember slides from the old days showing the thousands of letters from listeners who wanted to know more about this Jesus and who said they'd found meaning and purpose in their lives because of the programmes. John was station director in Seychelles for about nine years and then he and his family came back on furlough in the UK and lived next door to our family in Skywave's house above the FIBA offices. Then he became General Director of FIBA in the UK at the headquarters in Adelston and then in Worthing until his retirement. So John, Alice and the family have always been there in the background of my life and their humility and dedicated service to the Lord were a tremendous example to me growing up. In the early days, I think I was too young to appreciate the incredible story of FIBA and all that John and the founders achieved because they trusted God. It was only later that I came to realise what a remarkable person John Wheatley was, that he was driven and determined when he set his mind to something. Nothing fazed him, that he was clever and could go to the heart of complex issues, discern what needed to be done to solve problems and make things happen. He could think outside the box and he could think big. He had a great sense of humour, and I can remember him going into chortles of laughter as he recounted some adventure or other in the cause of FIBA. 
I think he rather enjoyed living dangerously for the kingdom. I so enjoyed going to John's 90th birthday party last year, but it was tinged with sadness because it was hard to see this great man, once so strong and unstoppable, now quite frail. But I'm so glad too that last year John was able to attend Phoebe's Diamond anniversary, where we celebrated and rededicated ourselves to the work that was his vision and his life, using radio, the internet and emerging technologies to break down barriers of persecution and isolation, to strengthen listener faith and inspire them to become followers of Jesus and experience the new life and peace he brings.